Did know. you sign in yet, Fran? The light is in my eyes. I can't stand it. Did you sign in, sir? Thank you. <laughs> no, I won't do it. I lost contact with Bob Craycraft. UNH. You know, Amanda sir? should be here tonight, McQueen. Think Bob will be here? I do. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, this is a big crowd. Figured you'd all be at the beach. Um, <laughs> first of all, I just want to let you know that this is being recorded for folks that uh, could not make it today but want to view it later on. My name is Kevin Kelly. I'm on the Lake Kanasaka Watershed Association Board of Directors. And I've also been on Kanasaka for 40 years involved with water quality testing. And I'm also the chair of the newly formed Molten Borough Cyanobacteria Committee. And we have some of our members today, Cornelia Schneider, Bonna Dow up in the back, Bree Rossiter, who is speaking tonight, and Jim Nelson. Where's Jim? Raise your hand. Quiet Jim's back in the back. Okay, first of all, I want to thank Harry Vogel uh, and the Loon Preservation Committee for allowing us to use this facility. We, uh, we on our committee uh, realized that if we came here, we would draw a larger crowd because it's just such a, a warm and friendly place. So I'd also like to acknowledge Bill Gassman, who is our technical guy. He's doing the recording. Uh, Bill also does all the technical stuff for the loon cams and uh, not just technical, he's out in the woods uh, helping set things up and Bill's everywhere. He's a member of the uh, Moulton Borough Conservation Commission and he also flew the drone over Lake Kanasaka while we were doing our alum treatment. So he's, he, he does everything. Is Amanda here? Okay. So I'll get right to it. Um, tonight's presentation will be by Bree Rossiter. She's the conservation program manager for the Lake Winnipesaukee Alliance. It used to be the Lake Winnipesaukee Association. Now it's the Alliance. Bree's role at LWA is to develop, manage, and implement new and existing programs designed to carry out LWA's mission. She leads the water quality monitoring, cyanobacteria, and lake smart program, as well as several nutrient mitigation projects. Her experience comes from previous employment with New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services and Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Bree has a BS in environmental science and policy with a minor in sustainability from Plymouth State University. Wow. And Bree is on call practically 24 seven. When I'm out in the field and I come across some crazy thing in the water, I, I text or, or email her a, a video or picture and she gets right back to me. And we, we did it just the other day. So without further ado, Bree Rossiter. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you to LPC and the Moulton Borough Cyanobacteria Committee um, for hosting this wonderful event. Um, we're really happy with the turnout and, and how many people really came out tonight. So to give you a little bit of background, the Lake Winnipesaukee Alliance, which was previously the Lake Winnipesaukee Association, was founded by volunteers in 1976. We are the only organization that is solely focused on protecting and preserving Lake Winnipesaukee and its watershed. When I started with LWA a little over three years ago now, we said that we were doing this work for future generations. But that isn't the case today. It's a constant battle to protect the lake that we love against various threats. And it's more important now than ever because it just is, isn't just for future generations anymore. It's a necessity for everyone who enjoys the lake today. The Word Alliance was chosen to highlight the critical role that property owners, businesses, municipalities, and recreational users all play in protecting the water quality of Lake Winnipesaukee. So again, thank you for being here tonight. Your presence here today shows that you care about protecting our valuable water bodies, 
There are a million reasons why people love our lakes. Boating, fishing, recreational opportunities, and scenic landscape, but also the loons. <laughs> so Lake Winnie, which covers about 44,000 acres for the watershed as a whole, likely hosts more than 50 pairs of loons, and they're considered an indicator of good water quality. So we need our lake to thrive um, for our loons to thrive. So today we're here to talk about cyanobacteria. Can everybody see the screen okay? Oh, okay, better. is that a little better? All right, great, thank you, Harry. So tonight we're here to talk about cyanobacteria and I wanna start with the basics. So cyanobacteria are naturally occurring organisms that have known fossil records dating back over two billion years. They play a crucial role in our aquatic and our terrestrial ecosystems. They were previously referred to as blue-green algae because of their color and superficial resemblance, but they are not an algae. Most of the press around cyanobacteria today tends to be negative, citing horrendous neon-colored blooms that plague our waterways and limit recreation. But billions of years ago, they laid the foundation for the development of the atmospheric conditions that support the diversity of life on Earth today. Cyanobacteria are believed to be some of the earliest uh, organisms capable of producing oxygen through photosynthesis, and they thrive in some of the most extreme habitats on Earth. Hot springs with temperatures over 150 degrees, in deserts, salt flats, and even in Antarctica. This adaptability highlights their ability to persist in diverse and harsh conditions. They have three main growth factors. The first is sunlight because they are photosynthetic. The second is water temperature, ideally around 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. And the third is nutrients, namely phosphorus, but also nitrogen as well. These are a couple photos of cyanobacteria blooms. The one on the left is from Utah in 2016. The one on the top is from Yellowstone National Park in November of 2019. And the one on the bottom right is on Governor's Island of June 2024 of this year. So our concern is not with the cyanobacteria itself, but the ability of cyanobacteria to proliferate to a state where they can produce a bloom. Several different types of algae and bacteria can produce toxic harm harmful algal blooms, or HABs. They are, the, those most associated with freshwaters do tend to be the cyanobacteria, like the microcystis bloom that you see in the top right. And then the most common algae associated with marine toxic HABs, which some of you may know about, um, include the dinoflagellates, like Karenia brevis or the red tide in Florida. It's important to note that not all HABs, harmful algal blooms, are toxic and there is no distinct way to tell if a bloom is toxic or not just by looking at it. There are some quick toxin tests on the market, but unfortunately they're just not very reliable. So why are we seeing these blooms more often? Scientists agree that these HABs are becoming increasingly common both in the US and worldwide. The rise is linked to human activities, things like agricultural runoff, urban development, recreational pressures, and all of these things contribute excess nutrients to water bodies, fueling the growth of these blooms. When it rains, water picks up sediment and pollutants from impervious surfaces, so things like rooftops, roads, yards, and carry it into our storm drains, and ultimately into our lakes. This process is known as runoff. During this time, those nutrients from fertilizers, septic systems, and other sources are washed into our lakes, a process that is known as nutrient loading. So just like us, our, our lakes age too, and excessive nutrient loading accelerates the rate at which our lakes age. Additionally, climate change is extending periods of warmer temperatures, creating these ideal conditions for cyanobacteria to bloom. I'm just gonna read this at the bottom for anybody that might not be able to see it. Um, 
Cultural eutrophication is really important, and it's a process that occurs when human activities and excess nutrients to a body of water speed up its aging process. So an excessive growth of plants and algae indicate that this process is occurring. Like I said before, climate change is significantly impacting our lakes. More frequent and extreme weather events are leading to increased runoff and erosion, introducing pollutants and phosphorus-rich sediment into our water, which can fuel these harmful algal blooms. An example of those storms is the top right photo. That's Alton, uh, Alton Bay in July of 2023. And you can, it's a little hard to see on that side, but there is a stream to the right. So all of that sediment and road debris and nutrients are washing off into that stream, which eventually ends up in Winnipesaukee. Mm -hmm. Warming temperatures are also impacting the stratification of our lakes. So during the summer, Lake Winnipesaukee forms distinct layers, a warmer surf surface layer, a cooler middle layer, and then a cold bottom layer. Normally, lakes like Winnipesaukee turn over and mix twice per year, once in the spring and once in the fall, when cooler temperatures allow that to happen. When this happens, oxygen and nutrients are redistributed into that water column and made available. So one of the reasons why we tend to see an increase in har harmful algal blooms in the spring and in the fall is due to that turnover process. Now additionally, shifts in ice in and ice out dates are altering these seasonal cycles. In 2024, Lake Winnipesaukee experienced record low ice coverage with ice out occurring after just 37 days. You can see photos um, up here on the slide. This bottom right photo is of around May 15th of 2023, satellite imagery of Lake Winnipesaukee, and you can see the ice coverage. This photo is around the same date, May 15th, but it's 2024, and there's almost no ice. 40, 50, 60 years ago, we really did not understand the impacts that our actions would have on the lake. Our infrastructure was set up to move water away from homes and businesses and often empty directly into the lake. We are dealing with those consequences now. Infrastructure is not an easy thing to be able to change. The main pollutant of concern to our lakes is the nutrient phosphorus. This is naturally occurring in small amounts in the environment. Most people know phosphorus, or P, as the middle number on the fertilizer bag. But as I explained before, that isn't the only way phosphorus enters our lakes. The main way phosphorus enters our lakes, and our biggest concern, is with stormwater pollution. So this increased nutrient load for our lakes is acting as food not just for cyanobacteria, but also for invasive species like milfoil, native green algae, which you can see here, and those cyanobacteria. We know from our research that phosphorus loading has increased over 300% over natural background levels, meaning, meaning pure pre-European settlement. And one really important thing to note is that one pound of phosphorus can support 500 pounds of algal growth. So it's extremely important. In addition to increasing phosphorus levels, we are also seeing an increase in aquatic invasive species. An example of this is the spiny water flea down here. In September of 2023, it was documented in Lake Winnipesaukee by the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And it was most likely spread to our lakes through recreational boating. It's not just in Winnipesaukee, it's also been found in Winnesquam as well, but this is the first documentation of spiny water flea in the entire state. After talking with New Hampshire DES a couple weeks ago, uh, they completed their spiny water flea survey for this year in the middle of September, and spiny water flea was found in Alton Bay, the Broads, and Wolfboro Bay in 2023. After completing their survey this year, it is found in all parts of the lake except for Moultonboro. 
We aren't necessarily sure why it hasn't been found in Moultonboro yet, but DES's sampling analysis will uh, hopefully shed some more light on that in the future. So, where's the data that backs this up? This is a graph of the median total phosphorus levels in Lake Winnipesaukee. You can see it's grouped. So it starts at natural background, meaning uh, pre-European settlement when everything was completely forested and we didn't have the development that we have today. It then goes all the way, this last one is 2019 to 2023, so it's a couple years of data grouped together. The bars on the left show the total phosphorus levels and micrograms per liter. It's the same as parts per billion, so one part per billion is less than one drop in Olympic-sized swimming pool. So we're talking about really, really small amounts that can have a big impact. The New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services set, sets a threshold for our lakes. This threshold for Lake Winnipesaukee and other oligotrophic lakes is eight parts per billion, eight micrograms per liter. That's that dashed red line at the top. You can see that slowly, over time, we are starting to reach that threshold. So everyone is familiar with the shape of Winnipesaukee. It really acts like multiple different water bodies in some areas because of the different bays. For example, Moultonboro Bay Inlet, areas like Greens Basin or Lees Mills are completely different than the Broads. So what we did is we broke up that graph by sub-watershed, and I'll explain that a little bit more later, but essentially it's just the different parts of the lake. That black line again is that eight parts per billion or eight micrograms per liter for the state threshold. These green bars right here are showing the natural background levels in each area of the lake. The blue bars are showing our monitoring data just from 2019 to 2023. Now you can see in Moultonboro Bay Inlet that we have exceeded that eight parts per billion threshold. Moultonboro Bay Inlet um, is very complex in comparison to some of the other sub-watersheds just because of what's going on around it. Uh, there's a not, lot of natural inputs in that area as well. But all of this to say, we are slowly creeping up towards that threshold and towards that line. The only way to be able to reduce the occurrence of these cyanobacteria blooms is to get that blue bar down, which requires reducing the nutrient load to the lake. So we focus on restoration and mitigation as well, which I'll touch base on later. Let's see. Okay. So let's look at some of the different types of cyanobacteria that we can see in Winnie. These are examples from 2018, 2022, and 2023. Most of these are on Winnipesaukee. The only outlier is the top left, that's of Tucker Pond. That's a type of cyanobacteria called Warrenchinia, um, which we have seen on Lake Winnipesaukee. Usually, people think of cyanobacteria blooms as being blue-green paint-like striations on top of the water. But this just goes to show that cyanobacteria do not all look like that. It's also really important to note that cyanobacteria move through wind and wave action, so they don't necessarily hitchhike the same as uh, aquatic invasive species like milfoil. So just because a bloom is occurring in one location does not necessarily mean that that property owner is doing anything poorly to cause those blooms. So in response to the increase of cyanobacteria alerts and to increase public outreach, in 2022, we created this weekly report card. Uh, this is an example from June of this year that shows the different areas of the lake where uh, NHDES has issued cyanobacteria warnings. This graph on the bottom left is from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And it shows the areas of Lake Winnipesaukee in August of this year that were under uh, cyanobacteria warning. The areas in red indicate that it's under a warning, meaning that the cell count for samples collected in that area are 70,000 cells per milliliter or over, which is the state threshold to have a potential health risk associated with these cyanobacteria blooms. 
The areas in orange are known as cyanobacteria watches. It means cyanobacteria have been reported in that area and sampled, but the cell counts were under that 70,000 cells per milliliter threshold that the state sets um, for primary recreation. All of the little black triangles on this map show cyanobacteria observations that were reported to LWA and NHDES, the Department of Environmental Services, and confirmed either through sampling or through uh, photographic evidence of the bloom. In 2021, we had zero cyanobacteria warnings on Lake Winnipesaukee, meaning that none of the samples exceeded that 70,000 cells per milliliter recreational potential health risk. Uh, but we had 14 observations. So it's, it's been around, um, you know, even in just the last couple years. 2022, we're up to four warnings. 2023, we're up to two warnings. But 2024 was a completely different year for Lake Winnipesaukee. We saw more cyanobacteria blooms this year than we ever had in the past. And you may be asking, maybe that's because of an increase in education. That is a big piece of it. But these blooms that we were seeing were in areas that we don't usually see them. We had a bloom in the middle of the broads, uh, along Rattlesnake Island that faces the broads, areas we don't usually see these cyanobacteria blooms and have not in the past. Are the 10 warnings um, the, under the red circle? Yep, so yeah. that is, it's 10 warnings for all of 2024. Something else that's really important to note with that is the Department of Environmental Services changed the way that they're reporting on Lake Winnipesaukee for this year. Previously, they had done it um, a little bit more specific. So for example, Rather than putting a warning for the entirety of um, the Wolfboro Bay sub-watershed, which is this whole area right here, it would just be in Moultonboro Bay, or in Wolfboro Bay, excuse me. So really, it's 10 warnings, but it's in a lot bigger area than was previously reported. Here's an example of cyanobacteria blooms that we saw on Lake Winnipesaukee from June 12th to June 24th of this year. We have Cedar Cove and Alton, that Rattlesnake Island, Meredith Bay, Center Harbor Bay, Bear Island. This is in the broads, and on the left is that Governor's Island photo again, just to show you that we really were seeing these blooms in all different areas of the lake. Now, one of the reasons um, why we think we experienced some of the most cyanobacteria blooms this last year is for a variety of reasons. Number one, that limited ice out that we talked about. That allows more sunlight to enter the water column earlier in the season, feeding those cyanobacteria blooms. What winter does for our lakes is it puts it in almost a dormant state and puts it to sleep. And if we don't have that ice covering the top of that water, cyanobacteria, algae, plants, all of that are gonna to continue to grow if there's sunlight available. The other reasons, that lake turnover that I was talking about. So both in late spring and in fall, the water column uh, combines together, allowing more nutrients to become available. So what is the risk to humans and pets with these blooms? Health effects in humans include things like skin irritation, gastrointestinal issues, long-term effects being neurological damage and liver damage. The two main ways that folks are, um, the two main ways that cyanobacteria blooms are impacted to humans is through ingestion and skin contact. So kids and pets are the most at risk because of this. Health effects in pets are very similar to humans. You know, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, weakness, seizures, and difficulty breathing are all things that have been documented in dogs specifically that have ingested these cyanobacteria blooms. Over the summer, we did receive reports from lake goers after swimming in blooms, not knowing what they were swimming in, thinking it was maybe just some, some algae or, or pollen, especially in late spring. Um, we mostly had reports of just uh, dermatological rashes and headaches, nausea, things like that. But we did have one report of um, a small child that had uh, chest congestion, later leading to pneumonia. There's no way to know if the, a bloom is toxic just by looking at it. 
and it's really hard to completely say this is exactly why this person is experiencing these things with all of the potential envir environmental factors that are out there, but it is a concern. Uh, this is a picture on the top left of a cyanobacteria bloom that was found in South Portland Park in Maine in 2019, um, and the bottom one is off the coast of Maine as well. <clears throat> so we know the health risks. Is it safe to swim, boat, or use the water when there are cyanobacteria blooms present? We highly recommend not recreating in the water where there is an active bloom. The New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, along with different town representatives, will post those red signs at different public access areas if the bloom sample exceeded that 70,000 cells per milliliter and um, was, a, was a cyanobacteria warning. Unlike E. coli warnings that the state also issues, beaches are not closed during cyanobacteria blooms. So it is up to the public to make the determination, educate themselves, and understand the risks associated with recreating in these blooms. But what about during a watch? What if they take a sample, it's below the potential health risk? What we're asking folks to do, what the state is asking folks to do, is to complete a visual assessment of the water. You know the water best, especially if you live on it or it's an area that you recreate in often. If the water looks off, please don't go in. Something else to note is that boiling the water does not remove toxins. Um, there is currently no water filtration system that can completely eliminate the potential of cyanobacteria toxins. And then what about boating? There is a lot of ongoing research that suggests that there is a potential for cyanobacteria toxins to aerosolize when boating. So we also do not recommend boating through an active bloom. But what if you already did? LWA, the DES, EPA, and CDC are all recommending to wash with fresh, clean water immediately after swimming through a bloom. This is especially important for kids and pets. Um, and then secondly, monitor any symptoms and seek medical attention if necessary. DES is working with CDC to document um, any potential cases in New Hampshire and uh, moving forward to be able to do that. This is another example of the history of cyanobacteria on Lake Winnipesaukee. That graph on the left is Lake Winnipesaukee specific. So again, we have those numbers. You can see in 2021, we had zero advisories. 2024, we're up to 10. This graph on the right shows the amount of cyanobacteria warnings statewide starting in 2003 and ending in 2004. So the axes on the left go from zero to 100. We had um, a record year in 2023 with 69 warnings statewide. 2024, we're down just a couple. I think we're at 67 right now. But you can see how much the increase of cyanobacteria has increased statewide, not just on Winnipesaukee. So the big question, are there treatment options for these cyanobacteria blooms? Unfortunately, there is no quick fix for this, especially not for a lake the size of Winnipesaukee. Some of you may have heard of an alum treatment that was done on Lake Kanasaka. Lake Kanasaka had a severe problem with cyanobacteria blooms starting the last two to four years ago. They worked with DES, LWA, and outside consultants to complete a watershed management plan, which I will talk about a little bit more, um, and also participate in the Lake Smart program that educates property owners what they can do on their property to help the lake. This was only the third alum treatment that was done in the entire state. It is not a permanent fix and it's very expensive. The only reason that the Lake Kanasaka Watershed Association was able to have this treatment done on Lake Kanasaka is for a couple of reasons. Number one, they had their watershed management plan completed, which prioritized specific sites that they needed to take action and fix, 
to limit nutrient loading to the lake. They did that. They completed those sites that were identified in their plans. Like I said, they also participated in the Lake Smart program. And not only that, they continue project implementation with their boots on the ground efforts, installing things like rubber razors or cleaning out culverts, replacing culverts, things that are really going to make a difference in the amount of runoff that goes into the lake and the ability for it to be filtered. So if you see a bloom, who should you contact? New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services should always be your first point of contact if you see a bloom. They have a bloom reporting tool on their website. It's really easy. Even if you just Google NHDES reporting tool, it'll be the first link that comes right up. Um, and so it's important to be able to document these blooms. So we're asking folks and the reporting tool will ask you to record the location, the day, and the time that you're seeing those blooms. Um, as well as photos. Those are, those are very important. And what we're asking you to do is fill out that reporting tool, share it with DES that way, and also share with LWA. We're working with DES to be able to collaborate on sampling efforts. Um, the state is, uh, has a lot of lakes, as we all know, so the more that we can help them, connect with them, connect with people within our watershed, it's only going to um, help. And this is an example of that bloom, uh, bloom reporting tool. This is what it'll look like when you pull it up. So next, I'd just like to touch base on what LWA is doing to be able to um, address cyanobacteria blooms and, and other threats to Lake Winnipesaukee as well. We rely on science-guided approaches for our lake management actions. We do this a variety of ways through the watershed management plans, through lake restoration, through our water quality monitoring program, and then finally through education and outreach. Lake management is the only way that we can keep those in lake levels of phosphorus from increasing by decreasing the amount of the pollutants coming into the lake. So this on the right is a map of the Lake Winnipesaukee watershed. We have 10 sub-watersheds that fall within Lake Winnipesaukee. And so we break up these management plans by sub-watersheds so that we can really focus on each area because they are so different. And what watershed management plans are, are they're a roadmap to be able to guide the community forward. So at the, the most basic level, they're really a resource assessment, identifying potential threats, and then developing strategies to be able to mitigate those threats. In detail, watershed management plans are a way to inventory and prioritize sites that contribute excessive sediment and nutrient loading. Something that's really important to note is during these watershed management plans, we do watershed surveys and shoreline surveys. During the watershed surveys, we go to all public roads within the watershed. We look at things like any of the culverts, stormwater drains, areas that are in need of mitigation or, or causing uh, severe sedimentation or erosion to the lake. And that allows us to develop an action plan of structural and non-structural projects. So structural meaning things like I said, culvert replacements or non-structural meaning things like ordinances or education, outreach, uh, to be able to connect to people within the watershed. Another part of this watershed management plan is reviewing any of the water quality monitoring data that we have and setting water quality goals moving forward. What these watershed management plans do as well is open up potential funding opportunities to implement the recommendations that are identified within these plans. So something else is that we have completed uh, six watershed management plans out of the 10 sub-watersheds that we have on Winnipesaukee. We are currently working on Wolfboro Bay right now, and it's set to be finished by the end of the year. That means we have three more sub-watersheds to tackle. We were awarded $500,000 uh, through a congressional-directed spending grant through Senator Jean Shaheen to complete the watershed management plans in those three remaining bays. So that's Alton, Center Harbor, and the Broads. 
Senator Shaheen secured $89 million for 95 projects statewide in New Hampshire. The New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services ranked the proposals that fall under the Department of the Interior and the Environment. LWA's proposal to help finish the watershed management plans was ranked number one in the state. So completing these plans will allow us to have an entire comprehensive whole lake understanding of what's going on and what we can do to fix it. But action plans don't do any good if they're not acted upon. So on the left is a map of our restoration sites that we have identified in the plans to date. There are 271 sites that have been identified just in those six plans. Please keep in mind that this does not include other watershed management plans that have been done like Lake Kanasatka Watershed Association's plan or Mary Meeting Lake Association's plan or Lake Wentworth's Association's plan. So there are realistically a lot more projects that need to be done. Again, this number only represents public sites because we are not allowed to access private property uh, during these watershed surveys or for these watershed management plans. Um, to be able to implement these projects, we work with communities, residents, businesses, um, and others to be able to really implement these projects and make a difference. I think it's important to note the amount of pollutant load reductions that the 50 projects that we've completed to date have finished. So that's 85 pounds of total phosphorus entering the lake per year that is no longer happening and 137,774 pounds of total suspended solids. So that's things like sediment. That's equivalent to removing 69 tons of sediment from the lake annually. So it's significant. This is an example of some of the restoration projects that we've completed. On the left is two different bioretention areas at Winnipesaukee Beach Colony Club in Meredith. The top photos are showing you what it looked like before and the bottom photos are showing what it looked like after. The middle is a culvert replacement that was identified on Ossipee Mountain Road in Moultonboro. And one of the larger projects that we had was the rain garden installation at State's Landing. So again, just an example of some of the projects that have been identified during these watershed management plans. Something else that we're focused on is water quality monitoring. Building an active and sustained water quality monitoring program by 2022 was a goal within our strategic plan. The monitoring, plan, the monitoring program on Winnie was established um, over 40 years ago, and we do this by partnering with the University of New Hampshire's UNH Lakes Lay Monitoring Program. And we're really proud to say that over the last 12 years, we've really expanded this. And we have over 60 monitoring stations and over 35 volunteers that assist us with these efforts monthly from June to September. This is really important because the successful water quality monitoring program is a primary indicator for measuring those reductions for the projects that we've completed and overall tracking the long-term health of the lake. These are just some of the photos of water quality monitoring. On the bottom left is actually a monitoring sond. It's monitoring uh, equipment that shares real-time data with the Meredith Water Department. We received a grant to be able to do this program because it is a source water, the drinking water source for the city of Merit or for the um, town of Meredith. So we are doing this in collaboration with the Town of Meredith, the Meredith Water Department, and um, Waukewan Watershed Association as well. In addition, we do education and outreach. So I talked about the Lake Smart program. I'm going to talk about a little bit about that on the next slide a little bit more. But we also do public pre presentations just like this one on cyanobacteria, on septic systems, on uh, smart landscaping by the water. We lead community cleanup days. Last week, maybe week before, we had about 100 volunteers come out, clean up different areas around the lake, both on the shoreline and on roads, and it was really, really su successful. We also provide educational materials. There's a couple um, on that back table if you'd like to check some of them out. 
and we implemented a phosphate-free fertilizer program in 2022. So we distributed these phosphate-free rack cards to any of the hardware stores within the watershed so that folks can be aware of the impact that phosphate fertilizer can have on our water bodies. Something else that we're focused on is legislation, whether that be local and or state efforts. We went to the state house last year, uh, did public testimony on multiple bills, and also share that information with any of our members. We are going to be working on a lake-wide septic system analysis, inventorying all of the septic systems that the state or towns have data on around the lake. And this year, we're also going to be doing an ordinance review with all of the towns around the lake to try to establish a framework for them to follow to make it easy to establish ordinances. Some of our future goals include improved water quality monitoring, like the project on Wan that I talked about. We're also looking to do that on Pogus Bay because it's the drinking water source for the city of Laconia. We'd also like to increase our cyanobacteria monitoring and identification program. We'd like to switch and have some year-round winter water quality analysis as well, and chloride sampling to monitor the potential effects of road salt on our water bodies. So let's talk about that Lake Smart program that I've touched base on a couple times. The Lake Smart program is a program that is run and started by New Hampshire Lakes. It is a free, voluntary, and non-regulatory program that LWA is facilitating on Lake Winnipesaukee. What happens is you sign up for the program, you fill out maybe a five-minute self-assessment survey, someone from LWA will come to your property walk your property with you, listen to any concerns that you have, talk to you about a couple different things, things like when was the last time you had your septic system pumped out, or maybe recommend increasing your vegetational buffer by your shoreline to help limit pollutants, looking at your yard, footpaths, things like that, and you'll receive a personalized Lake Smart report that will identify those potential problems and. A, uh, provide you with some really simple cost-effective solutions to be able to mitigate those issues. Okay, so next I would like to talk a little bit about the Moulton Borough Cyanobacteria Committee. We were established under the Conservation Commission and the purpose of the committee is to develop and promote a town-wide strategy to address the environmental, social, and economic impacts of cyanobacteria blooms within the town surface waters. One thing that we are planning to do in the future and have already kind of gotten started on is creating the Cyanobacteria Watch Program. One of the most difficult parts of cyanobacteria bloom sampling is because these blooms are ephemeral and move with wind and wave action, uh, sometimes it's really hard to get out there to be able to take a sample, whether it's for the property owner or NHDES. They have one to two full-time staff members coordinating the cyanobacteria program for the entire state and only one or two interns every summer. So that is uh, statewide, you know, maybe three or four people. So we're working with them to be able to increase sampling efforts and communication on that as well. So LWA does not uh, own a boat. We rely on volunteers to help with our regular, regular monitoring program. Um, and we really need folks, the Moulton Borough Cyanobacteria Committee needs folks to be eyes on the water. Reporting blooms to your local contact person, being Kevin, um, that can come out. Kevin can come take a sample if you're seeing a cyanobacteria bloom. But really, we just, just need people to be watching their shorelines and areas and, and reporting those blooms if they see them. One really good example of this occurred uh, this summer. We were kind of able to pilot test that program. I got a call from Kate Hastings, who's the cyanobacteria coordinator for NHDES that there was a potential bloom on Land's End in Moulton Borough. Um, at the time, I had a couple meetings, wasn't able to leave the office, and so I contacted Kevin to see if he would be able to go out and take a sample. Um, 
unbeknownst to me, Kevin and the, the property owner that reported the bloom uh, had, had previously connected. So he already knew them. It was easy for him to just be able to go out, take that sample, coordinate with LWA and DES to get that sample to Concord. So that's just an example of how we would like the cyanobacteria watcher program to work. If you're interested in volunteering in this or learning more, um, I believe we have a sign-up sheet uh, in the back that we would, would really welcome your participation in. Also, we have a Facebook page, the Moulton Borough Cyanobacteria Committee. So if you uh, would like to follow along and, and uh, on our journey and see our updates, that would be fantastic. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Questions. Oh yeah, if anybody has questions, let us know. You can raise your hand. Bill's got a little mic he'll, he'll bring around. So this is being recorded too, so anyone that's uh, watching the recording later will be able to hear you as well. Thank you for the presentation. Um, at the be Close to the beginning, there was a, some dotted, dotted lines that was the threshold marker. Mm -hmm. What does the, if we, once we reach the threshold, what does that mean for a lake? Yeah, so once we reach, I can get to it. So everybody can and see all it. of them were at the top. What does that what would that mean for the lake? It means that we have a uh, phosphorus level that will just continue to feed these cyanobacteria blooms, feed that milfoil, feed native algae. We will have more overall productivity in the entire lake biologically. And decreasing water quality as well. Yeah, is there a there's another question in the back. We just wanted to pass the mic around. I get confused between internal loading of phosphorus and external loading of phosphorus. Can you explain that? Yes. So internal loading of phosphorus, the easiest, most basic way to describe that is internal loading of phosphorus is that phosphorus load that is in the lake already. Once we get phosphorus in the lake, settles to the bottom sediment, and then during those different turnover processes like I was talking about, that phosphorus becomes available. So it's the internal load of phosphorus within the lake. That external load of phosphorus is everything that's coming um, from different areas in the watershed, not necessarily just shoreline properties either. So it's any of that stormwater runoff that's entering into our system, meaning external adding, external loading adds to the internal loading. Yeah. So, uh, great presentation. Can you just take the mic, please? Thank you. Great presentation. I also had a question on that chart, though. That looks to me like phosphorus levels are actually down over the last 25 years. So the question is, is there something else that's actually driving the cyanobacteria other mm -hmm. than phosphorus? So there's a lot of work on the phosphorus, but is there something else that's causing a problem? And then the second part of my question is, since I shower in lake water, is there a test after the bloom is gone, to a water test for the actual toxin to know that that's kind of cleared out? Yeah, unfortunately, there's really no quick toxin testing that's reliable on the market for that right now. And then to, to get back to the, your question, spot on, between 1994 and 1998, we had really high phosphorus levels. And you can see, this is 2004, 2008, dipping back down, dipping back down. This is 2014 to 2018, and this is 2019 to 2023. So it's a little bit hard to tell, but we are increasing again, even though it's just minute. It's, it's uh, conglomerated because there's three or four years of, of data within there. So yeah, we had some really high phosphorus levels then. Something else is that um, it takes a long time for our lake to react to the impacts that we have. So whether you know, whether it's development or deforestation or septic systems or fertilizer use or things like that, we aren't going to be seeing those impacts, you know, one to two years later. It's really going to be 10 years later that we're seeing those impacts. Hi, Bree. Thank you so much for the presentation and for everything that LWA and, and everyone is doing um, to address this. I have two questions. Um, the first is, 
I know that many of us would like to share this presentation um, with our family and friends. Do you, can you tell us where this will be posted? Yeah, it will be on LWA's YouTube page. We will share it on LWA's Facebook. We'll share it on the Moulton Borough Cyanobacteria Committee Facebook page as well. Uh, so if you follow there, as soon as we get it posted, you'll be able to share it with everyone, but YouTube. Okay, great, thank you. And my second question, um, there are a lot of great programs and, and um, volunteer opportunities to so people can help and try to do their part to um, to prevent cyanobacteria in the first place, the human-made um, con contributions. And I'm wondering if you happen to have a list of things that people can do, maybe a sheet like a handout sheet of, you know, watch out for your fertilizer, pump out your septic, report a bloom, um, donate to LWA. That <laughs> like always all helps. <laughs> of, like, do you happen to have something like that? Yeah, so if you go to our website, we don't necessarily have a one-page printout, but we do have a, a how we protect section at the bar on the top of our website, and there's a bunch of different uh, uh, variables in there, things like septic systems or development. Um, the other thing is there's a wrap card in the back. It's called A Dozen Ways to Love Lake Winnipesaukee. And so that has a list um, as well. But it's a great idea to put a quick little fact sheet together. I would say if you are interested in things that you can do on your specific property, the Lake Smart program is a great opportunity to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Just gotta wait for the mic. Just a, a quick question. You showed some of the mitigation mm -hmm. things that were done and like basically putting rocks in for culverts. What, how is that? Is that filtering the phosphorus out? Or how is that working? Yeah, exactly. So um, a lot of the times culverts were built and um, considering the rainfall immense amounts and precipitation events, things like that that were happening previously, you know, with climate change, obviously, as most of you know, our, our heavy rainstorms are um, they're getting a lot heavier. So we have a lot more water coming down in a lot shorter period of time. We have an increase in impervious surface pulling all of those things into those specific culverts. So if they're undersized, that water's not able to filter through. Those rocks that you're talking about are really important. They're called riprap. And what it does is it increases the surface area for water to be able to go on so that it will slow down that stormwater runoff and then filter it by allowing it to naturally soak into the ground. Another um, example of that would be adding vegetation. So there's something called a vegetated swale which is essentially very similar to a culvert, but it has native vegetation in it because native vegetation has uh, really deep roots, unlike things that are non-native or invasive, that will help filter that stormwater runoff before it enters the lake. Yeah. So uh, is there a way to test for the internal loading versus the external loading of the phosphorus? Yep. Because you have existing lakes and so that is all done during the watershed management plans. So in each watershed management plan that we have completed, uh, including one for Moulton Borough Bay and Moulton Borough Bay Inlet, the external load and the internal load are both modeled to determine kind of where we're at um, and understand what the load is or where the main load of phosphorus is coming from within each of those subwatersheds. Are you seeing any impact to wildlife? And is anybody monitoring that from cyanobacteria blooms? Um, good question. I don't think we necessarily have uh, had specific reports of, of wildlife being impacted by those cyanobacteria blooms, but I think there's a lot of ongoing research, you know, nationwide, um, throughout the whole world, really, of potential impacts on wildlife. One of the things that cyanobacteria blooms can do is create an, an anoxic environment. So things um, like fish, for example, um, you can have massive fish kills with algae blooms and things like that. So it's not necessarily something that we've experienced on Winnipesaukee, but it does happen. And I have a second question, um, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, legislatively, yeah. are there things that you're putting out there that we can support you in um, for your initiative? Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> um, there are a few items that uh, were recently put up in the legislation, one being the cyanobacteria mitigation fund. 
um, which the uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental <coughs> Services is in control of um, helping to allocate in terms of helping to remediate these blooms. There's some additional cyanobacteria bills uh, that are going to be coming up in the legislature. There's other things as well. There was a septic system bill that was passed last year that now requires shorefront property owners to have their septic systems uh, inspected prior to sale. So if that septic system fails, then the um, seller is responsible for replacing that system prior to um, someone purchasing it. Thank you. Yeah, and also there's a fertilizer bill. Some of you may have heard about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, originally, it, it uh, was vetoed by Governor Sununu, and last week, maybe the week before, um, the House and the Senate both overturned that veto. And that fertilizer bill is really, really important. It does things like limit the application um, during rain events or if the ground is frozen. It limits the application within 25 feet of storm drains. And importantly, even, even more importantly, some, some might say, is it adds an education perspective. So all retailers um, that sell fertilizer are now required to put up signage saying how that fertilizer can potentially impact our lakes. I, 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 Todd. How much support do you have from the local landscapers? Uh, what was your question? What are you getting from the local landscapers? A lot, actually. Yeah, a lot. We, we've uh, talked to a lot of the, the major landscaping companies around the lake. A lot of them aren't using phosphate fertilizer anyway. Um, I think that we did a, a landscaping presentation with uh, one of the larger landscaping companies in Wolfboro a couple months ago now. That's also on our, our YouTube page, so there's a ton more information on there. But we have had support from them and, and have worked with them, um, even in like the state's landing restoration project, for an example, is a, a great uh, community collaborative effort with that. Uh, Todd Rindelstein here. I'm um, uh, curious about um, the Lake Winnipesaukee, the, the 10 um, groups that mm -hmm. you had. Do, does that include, incorporate um, uh, other lakes that fall into Lake Winnipesaukee? So, uh, like, is Kanasatka part of the Winnipesaukee group? Yes. And so, Lake Kanasatka is part of the uh, greater Winnipesaukee watershed. And then there's a couple other water bodies too, like Lake Wentworth in Wolfboro, for example, and things like that. Um, they're doing a, a lot of work on their own. Wentworth has their own watershed management plan. Kanasatka has their own watershed management plan, but we certainly work really closely. And just a comment related to that is that um, uh, when Lake Kanasatka uh, did their treatment, um, uh, we live um, about a football field away from Lake Kanasaka and about the football field away from Winnipesaukee. Um, and there's a stream there. And, uh, and that stream was actually closed off 100% or close to 100% so that the treatment in Lake Kanasaka, you know, could, could occur. And there had been an impact on wildlife um, in, in, in that area. And so my question uh, related to that, um, you know, would you know, would we be able to be a part of that, um, that, 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 that one of the 10 committees to have some input yeah. into that? And then the other um, question is, um, apparently the treatment worked well for Lake Kanesaki, at least that's what I hear from our neighbors, um, that it worked very well. Is that going to sustain? Is that going to stay like that? Um, and then related to that is, um, has the runoff from Lake Kanesaki, did that go into Lake Winnipesaukee before the treatment? I have an example. <laughs> okay. Yes, show and tell. So, can everybody see that? Okay, hopefully. Yeah. Um, this photo on the left is of Blackie Cove. That is where Lake Kanesaki drains into Lake Winnipesaukee through that little stream that you're talking about. When Lake Kanesaka was experiencing their cyanobacteria bloom, um, Blackie Cove did as well. I think something that's really important to note um, with the Kanesaka treatment is that they had some really, really severe blooms over the last you know, two to three years that were impacting the entire lake. The treatment was done in the deep spots of the lake. 
So long term, the treatment coupled with the grassroots effort that the Lake Kanasaka Watershed Association is doing to limit those phosphorus uh, loading into the lake should help to you know, mitigate those blooms long term. But the alum treatment is not permanent. You know, I think 10, 15, maybe 20 years depending. And it's also really expensive. So in terms of like thinking about something like that for Winnie, because of the size of Winnie, it's just, it's just not really realistic. Um, and then your other question was... I don't know, I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you remember, feel free to ask again. I don't have a question, Bree, I have a comment. Yeah, please. Um, when you talked about all the legislation that's been pushed through recently, um, the person who pushed most of that through is up in the back of the room. State Representative you Rosemary Rosemary, Rosemary, Rung from Merrimack. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, yeah. I actually, if you don't mind. Please. <laughs> I, I can give you a, and I do want to talk. Do you want to come up here so it can, oh, are you still that's recording, that's Bill? Okay. Okay. No, that's okay, thanks. Um, uh, but I, I do want to recognize Representative Crawford because she's been a great partner and co-sponsor a lot of this legislation. Um, but I do want to just give you a preview of a couple bills that we'll be seeing in January. One I've already filed, it's called a Love Your Lakes license plate. So it's a non-tax way of us to generate revenue that will fund the cyanobacteria mitigation fund. Um, I'm expecting probably a, a couple million dollars a year in revenue that will help finance some of these mitigation projects. Um, the other bill, uh, and that actually came from Andrea Lamarno from New Hampshire Lake. She had suggested that to me. And then another bill actually was a suggestion Kevin gave me to add um, uh, one of, a, a violation to the Shoreland Protection Act that would um, make it a violation when people dispose of, intentionally dispose of yard debris in water bodies because that does contribute a lot of phosphorus to the lake. And even though it's a best practice not to do that, having that in statute will give people, you know, a deterrent for doing it. And um, there's, there's another bill, I'm not really sure if, if that will come in this year, but it would be to expand the septic system legislation that I filed last year um, to go beyond properties within that shoreline protection zone. So if everybody, and I, I came here mainly because I wanted to hear the questions to see if anybody does have any ideas or concerns for legislation, things that the state can, can do to help mitigate these blooms. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Rosemary. Thank There's something everybody can do right now, today. If you live on the water and the leaves are falling in the water, you get your rake and you rake them out of the water. I've been doing that for years. People think I'm silly, but I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> because it does, it, that loads. I think something else that's super important to note with that is that obviously na naturally we have leaves that fall into our lakes, right? But blowing those leaves into the lake are obviously adding uh, more nutrients and, and organic matter and things like that. Um, raking is actually not necessarily recommended because when you rake anything out of the lake, um, it, you know, if it's blown in there, I guess it's different. But if you're raking anything in the lake, what you're doing is you're resuspending that sediment for those nutrients to be able to become available. But the ones that are floating aren't in the bottom. That are just on the, on the yeah, I think it's definitely a, a situational, <laughs> situational exception. But I do know that um, there are instances of, of, of folks, you know, raking, whether it's leaves or whether it's, you know, aquatic vegetation just to have a, a, you know, really nice sandy beachfront area, things like that, that can also have an impact on, on the nutrients in the water body. Can you describe a little more specifically about the process between an observation for the bacteria, uh, a phone call to Kevin, and then a trip down to Concord, and then sometime later a report comes back? Can you be a little bit more specific what the expectation is from uh, 
an observer, if you will. Or yeah. Here. So the way that it works, I'll say the way that it works right now, and then kind of the way that we'd like to move it for in the future, specifically for Moultonboro. The way that it works right now is that um, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services receives those Bloom reports, whether it's the Bloom reporting tool or a call or, or anything like that. They receive that report. If they're able to be able to go out and work with the property owner, potentially take a sample, that sample is then brought back to Concord. In order for an advisor, a, a warning, sorry, it used to be called advisory and now it's called warning, so it's very confusing. In order for a warning to be issued, that's when it's above the 70,000 cells per milliliter, a potential health risk, DES needs to look at that sample. So they need to have that sample in Concord. So right now it is LWA and NHDES working to collaborate to get those samples back and forth. Um, one of the problems with cyanobacteria, like I said, is that it moves, can move really quickly through wind and wave action. So identifying that cyanobacteria bloom and um, being able to act on it really quickly is important and it's a little bit of a barrier that we have right now. So what we're hoping with the Cyanobacteria Watchers Committee is that we have a list of residents that are either shorefront or, or have um, you know, public access, things like that. For them, if they see cyanobacteria on their shorefront in the area that they are, if they're out boating or anything like that, to um, contact the Cyanobacteria Committee person, AKA Kevin, Kevin um, and myself will coordinate to be able to figure out how to get out there, get a sample, and then get that, get that sample back to Concord. What's that turnaround time? How many days does it take to create the warning? Yeah, so DES is open Monday through Friday. Um, so weekend samples, you know, can get refrigerated. They can look at them on Monday, things like that. But usually, if Kate receives a sample, uh, she's looking at it that day, or if it's later in that afternoon, the next morning. It's a, it's a very quick turnaround time for them because they want to get that out there uh, and educate people, you know, about the the potential risks associated with that bloom. And the other thing is that um, cyanobacteria tracking map, the healthy swimming map, is is what it's called on their website. It has the uh, list of locations where those samples were collected for each area. So if you were to open that map, click on the red area, a little pop-up will come up and it will say the date that it was observed, the date that it was sampled, the taxa that was found, and potential cell counts as well. So I have a question with, for you about the internal load and then the point loads and then the management plan, basic. So you've identified locations where you have a higher internal load already based on what you said earlier. Mm -hmm. And then you already have uh, locations where we have higher external load input points, right? So we have where I would think we have a potential higher uh, potential for cyanobacteria uh, blooms. So do we have a, a management plan that is looking at that so we can be proactive in preventing this type of thing based on the on the grant funding that we already have so we can stay ahead of it so it's not like where you get a a bloom and then it transfers to another area that might be more shallow and, and warmer yeah so the phosphorus loading that's identified within each of these uh, watershed management plans by sub-watershed, just because there is a high phosphorus load in that one area doesn't necessarily mean that the cyanobacteria are going to, you know, stay in that area. They move through wind and wave action. So, um, you know, if there's higher phosphorus levels in Moultonboro than Wolfboro or things like that, it, it, it is going to contri contribute to the formation of those blooms. But in terms of how those blooms um, can move, it's, it, it differs. So you can't necessarily say like, okay, this side of the lake has higher internal loading, this side has external, and then focus from there. It really is like a lake-wide approach to be able to limit the overall nutrient loading to the lake. Does that help? Yeah, so just a follow-up question. So what's the, what's the management plan with this funding that we already have to curtail these potential blooms, in other words, to get ahead of it. I don't understand your question. Okay, so 
we have a management plan already right, mm -hmm. that we're looking at for the different zones in the lake. Yep. So the question is, we have funding to address this potential cyanobacteria blooms, right? We do not have funding. We, we have need funding. to seek, so the funds that we have um, received from the, the senator, the congressional directed spending grant, and anything that we've done to date to be able to finish these subwatershed plans is strictly for the plans. It is not for design, construction, implementation of any of the restoration projects. There is still a lot of funding that needs to um, that we need to you know be able to uh, kind of tap into the watershed management plans. One really beneficial piece of it is that having a watershed management plan allows us to apply for state funding. Um, to implement those projects, but in relation to the funding that's available for those projects and the amount of projects that we've identified on Winnie, just within the plans that we've identified to date, and some of these were done, you know, 2009, 2010, so, so you know, over 10 years ago now, we're estimating that it's going to cost probably about over, over $9 million dollars just in those 250 projects that we've identified to date, not leaving, not including the projects for the three subwatersheds that have yet to be done, or the other projects for other associations like Kanasaka or Wentworth or things like that. Okay, last question. Okay. So how do we stay ahead of that and get the funding so that we can move forward to prevent these things from occurring? Can I, we, so we can be proactive. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking the cyanobacteria uh, mitigation fund through the legislature, that will definitely help. And then as well as just spreading our reach. No, I think there's a lot of people that don't know about LWA and the work that, that we're doing. And we really, really need support and, and funding to be able to implement those projects. The other thing is that we talked about um, the, the projects that have ident we've identified are only on public property. So having that lake smart component, which is educational for private property owners, is something that is huge in terms of being able to make a real difference with simple actions. Thank you. You're welcome. Good questions. Anybody else? No? Okay. Thank you all very much for coming.